Rebecca Moeller is T32 postdoctoral fellow in the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics and genomics in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. She also teaches ethics and mentors student research in the Master of Science Genetic Counseling Program. Her talk is entitled Time, Future, and Genetics, the Temporal Complexity of Disability. Hi, I'm Becca Mueller. I'm an LC postdoctoral fellow in medical ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much to NHGRI and the University at Buffalo Center for Disability Studies for hosting this event. My talk today is on time, future, and genetics. Despite the moniker precision medicine, genetic diagnoses are often imprecise with respect to prognosis. And understanding how prognostic uncertainty is communicated and experienced within different contexts is really critical. For example, we know that there is a chasm between pre and postnatal descriptions of genetic disease, a twice told tale that illustrates how every description of a genetic disorder is a story that contains a message. But we know a lot less about how these same diseases are storied to affected children as they grow up. And I am particularly interested in conditions that have implications for life expectancy. Today, I'll be telling you a story about illness and time. It's a story about the scientific representation and lived experience of an evolving prognosis. It centers on cystic fibrosis as a sort of paradigmatic example of a pediatric disease that has gradually become survivable to adulthood. It's based on historical and ethnographic research on cystic fibrosis communities, but is no doubt inflected by my own experience living with cystic fibrosis and my professional experience as a genetic counselor. In focusing on the lived experience of people with CF, I'll illustrate how something as fundamental as time is shaped by prognosis and the projection and manifestation of disability. And this is critical to understand right now, given the prognostic implications of genetics and genomics, whereby normative futures are recast in uncertain ways. First, I'll say a bit about how treatment and survival in CF have changed. Then I'll talk about prognostic messages from the perspective of people with CF, emphasizing the impact of these messages on perceptions of the future. Finally, I'll show how plans are often predicated on prognostic expectations. So in parsing out how people with CF plan their lives with an evolving prognosis, I'll really start to highlight societal structures that are premised upon able bodies and normative lifespans that kind of bracket out disability as this static state. And I'll explain how these temporal aspects of ableism uh, um, compound the medical challenges that people with CF face. By pulling in theory from disability studies, I'll close by making specific recommendations to different stakeholders. Historically, a pediatric disease that was lethal in childhood, CF has been transformed through complex care regimens that have enabled many to live into adulthood. This chart here shows how CF was becoming more survivable long before this sort of current moment of targeted therapies called CFTR modulators. And it shows how life expectancy increased from just a few years old in, the, in 1950 to around 40 in the late 2010s. And each of the bars in this graph shows different types of treatments and when they were developed. And most of these treatments take you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes. So people with CF and their families devote many hours a day to lung treatments, like this pulsating therapy vest that you can see here on a little girl, as well as weeks or months to year to more intensive therapies. And that's because CF is a disease of exacerbations with baseline lung impairment and then periods of worsening infection necessitating IV therapy to minimize lung scarring and thus progression. 
And progression in CF is most often measured via lung function testing, where a metric called FEV1 is really the most prognostic single measure. CF is now rightly celebrated as a premier success story of precision medicine, given the recent advent of targeted therapies called CFTR modulators that correct the faulty protein that underlies the app. And so as of 2019, uh, the CF, about 90% of the CF population was eligible for an FDA-approved agent. And this was really big news because the drugs markedly reduced symptoms for many. Uh, some were able to reduce reliance on other really time-consuming therapies. And the hope, of course, is that they extend life significantly. What you can perhaps infer from this same chart is that median life expectancy is a blunt but popular metric for communicating the therapeutic progress, given the markedly improved survival that we see since World War II. Yet to people with CF and their families, this metric, um, as well as just the progressive nature of CF, can be really formative for closing possibilities when it comes to the future. So throughout my interviews, people with CF spoke about the shadow of a scary prognosis. Um, many have the median life expectancy committed to memory, and stories of learning that median life expectancy are really common. Life histories were also sometimes annotated with an evolving projected median life expectancy. People described really diverse sources of prognostic messages. So yes, people did hear about the life expectancy, sometimes from their doctors or conversations with their parents, but others got different messages about CF's prognosis from CF peers, biology textbooks, memoirs and movies like this one shown here called Alex, The Life of a Child, or social interactions with teachers, non-CF peers, um, non-CF providers, many of whom assumed that these individuals would die young. I'll highlight just one representative example of how people often learn about CF's prognosis, really just to flag how parents may have, uh, may you know, be the ones that have to deal with this really complex challenge of prognostic communication. <clears throat> At age six or seven, Hannah recalls, we were driving in the car and I asked my mom how old people with CF live and her whole body tensed up and she got really teary-eyed and she told me the average at the time was 25. And I definitely had that in my head growing up. So for some critical messages came from meeting CF elders who modeled longevity or less fortunate peers who died young. For example, Hannah had a camp counselor at CF camp who also had CF. And she recalled that meeting this woman felt like meeting a celebrity. Quote, like you have CF and you're how old? And she just did her treatments when we did our treatments. It was an impactful moment because at that point, I could imagine being an adult with CF. Like that is, that will happen, you know? I can go out into the world and be an adult with CF. So CF sociality, that is experiences within the CF community, informs what I've come to call prognostic imagination. The visualized projections that an individual can see, dream, hope, fear or plan for their lives. Well, Hannah's experience with a CF elder offered hope for another former camper named John, CF camp was actually where he first learned that CF could be lethal, which made him believe that he would soon cough up blood and ultimately die young. What I hope you can start to see is that certain prognostic messages get internalized and shape how individuals see their own futures. Respondents held really diverse and evolving ideas about the future, from envisioning a thriving adulthood to waiting to die. Others avoided big questions about the future by planning short-term goals, and some actually found life expectancy almost motivating as they chose, go chose goals that would push them forward. As noted, I call these varied ways in which people envision their lives in light of a diagnosis, prognostic imagination. And prognostic imagination doesn't stop at that level of hoping, fearing, or dreaming, but instead maps to actions, like making plans and the associated decisions. 
for individuals with CF who are diagnosed in childhood, ideas and, and decisions about higher education, employment, finances, marriage, and having kids were often predicated on both disease progression and abstract ideas about the prognosis. For example, to go back to Hannah, that simultaneous belief in adulthood and reduced life expectancy shaped her decisions throughout life. When we spoke, she was in her 30s and she explained, I felt so compelled that I wanted to live a huge life in whatever time I had. I went to college at 15, full time. I worked full time. I, married, I got married a week after I turned 18, moved 900 miles from home. I wanted to fit everything in. In contrast, John, who I mentioned before, believed that his disease would inevitably progress and lead him to die young. He too decided to live fast, but by turning to drugs and partying, decisions he said likely expedited his path to lung transplant. He explained how experience is seriously important to me. You know, I've done, I've done more than most healthy people do. So we can start to see that what people anticipate in terms of their health and longevity can impact the decisions and plans that they make. Perceptions of prognosis may therefore become actionable regardless of their accuracy. Of course, CF is a progressive disease, and for most adults, progression is embodied and physically limiting. Despite this, I contend that the prognosis alone, communicated in generalities with aggregate data, can have a profound and underappreciated impact on people with CF and their families. Take the experience of Alexandra. In her 20s, she went on disability and described waiting to die from that point forward. Reflecting on her life, she shared with me, here I am turning 50 this year, and I'm like, whoa, you know? I turned 30, I'm like, now what am I go going to do? I turned 40, I was like freaking out. Now I'm going to turn 50 and it's like, okay, have I wasted my life? But then I think, well, you know, I got all the medical care I needed because I was on disability. I never had to worry like other people, but I couldn't work. I have a college degree, but I couldn't work or get married because I'd lose my benefits. Like, now what do I do? Because here I am 50, and they're like, you know, this probably isn't going to kill you. It's like, really? This is 25 years too late for me to work or get a retirement plan or whatever you do. Alexandra is someone whose health had fluctuated over the years, and she spent a lot of time carrying out her own medical care. Despite many hard periods, her lung function was mildly impaired, and she was able to do volunteer work, but stopped short of pursuing employment, even though it may have increased her quality of life. Alexandra's story speaks to the challenges that people with CF and many other disabilities face as a result of societal structures that are premised upon able bodies with normative lifespans that bracket out disability as this static most obviously, state Medicaid plans and Social Security disability income have complex eligibility criteria and require permanent disability. There are, work there are work trial programs, and some states have more varied plans for workers with disabilities, though they have income and asset limits, and they tend to be hard to navigate. This means that people with CF facing worsening health might do the administrative work to qualify for Medicaid or for SSDI, and then feel kind of tethered to the program, unable to work or to marry, depending on the circumstances. Even in the event that their health does improve, even new therapies, these kinds of fears of health fluctuation and disease progression, the administrative challenge of requalifying for disability if they eventually go off of it, and the lack of part-time jobs with good benefits all impede people with CF and other disabilities from working. Retirement savings present another interesting challenge for people with life-limiting illnesses, given that these saving plans are really predicated on people living and working through their 60s. Although people who qualify as permanently disabled can generally access the retirement savings without a penalty, for people who are faced with progressive illness that limits life expectancy, saving for retirement can feel unwise. You know, for example, if illness progresses and pushes an individual to instead work part-time, it might actually be preferable to have liquid assets to bridge the difference when traditional retirement starts to seem really unlikely. At the same time, 
as disease prognosis improves with new treatments, past decisions not to save or not to pursue a career may become problematic. And there's a lot of talk of this now in the CF community as modulators really start to shift expectations of engagement. In addition to government and financial programs that assume disability as a static state, existing accommodation frameworks in work and education sometimes really fail to anticipate the kind of fluctuating needs and time demands that are so common in chronic and progressive illness. So genomic medicine often promises to provide prognostic information to enable disease prediction with the hope of early intervention. Yet when we look at the ground level and start to really understand the experience of people who are living in prognosis, to use the words of Sarah Lachlan Jane, we can see how predictions are not always helpful, absent thoughtful communication and societal support. It's therefore critical that clinicians, researchers, and policymakers begin to really grapple with the unique temporality of disability. If we look to disability studies and think about this modern category of disability historically, it's apparent that social attitudes towards disabled people became more negative around the turn of the 20th century. And one of the reasons why is a shift in perceptions of everyday time prompted by industrialization. So if you look to the language used to describe disability, there's the shift amidst industrialization from words like affliction to handicapped and retarded, which emphasize a slowing down and inability to keep up with new time standards. Within medical models of disease, we see a lot of temporal language, right? My use of chronic and progressive, and then there are developmental disabilities, which to quote Alison Kafer, do a kind of double duty, referring to both lifelong conditions that developed early in life, but also implying a delay in development, a sort of detour from a timeline of normative development. And this is a critical point, that disability is often defined as diverging from some normative expected course. Kafer, drawing on the work of Halberstam, tells a sort of middle class heteronormative life course that is foundational in our culture. This normative course also tends to underlie common developmental models. So I'm flashing up a few here so you can quickly see how these norms manifest in models of normal development, like Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, as well as Havinghurst's developmental task shown here. So in attempting to normative standards, and the language and tropes around disability, Kafer also theorizes something that she calls curative time that is so often at play in talking about disability. Curative time is not about any individual's relationship with medical interventions or an individual desire for a cure, but rather, quote, an understanding of disability that not only expects and assumes intervention, but also cannot imagine or comprehend anything other than intervention. In curative time, the disabled are cast out of time as obstacles to the arc of progress, to again quote Kafer. So when we look at how cure is discussed within medicine and the culture at large, it's really easy to see how we kind of lack ways to imagine a good future absent these curative therapies. And this is perhaps why many people with CF turn to one another to envision their own futures as desirable. Theorists like Alison Kafer and renowned anthropologists Faye Ginsberg and Raina Rapp have given us an activist scholarship to draw from that aims to forge an accessible and desirable future for people with disabilities as well as their families. So Ginsberg and Rapp drawing on work with different disability stakeholders describe how, quote, kinship, caregiving, and public culture are all being reorganized as the fact of disability is reconfigured over the life course. Their work is especially important for clinicians, researchers, and policymakers because it really speaks to the impact of disability diagnoses on family members. As quote, relationships and expectations are often revised, creating what we call the new kinship imaginary. As disabled kin move through the life cycle, their atypical experiences reverberate into the lives of their families 
in ways that reframe the taken for granted assumptions. Family recognized and reorganized tacit norms about familial relations and the temporality of the domestic cycle. Because that culturally ordered normative life course can no longer be assumed. Ginsburg and Rack's work shows how disabilities have this tremendous impact on family members and how families are often the main site of adaptation and support. Moving on to recommendations. What I want for clinicians working with families with CF and other variable and evolving childhood onset conditions to consider is that normative expectations around development and independence may be inappropriate and even harmful. There are a few great papers out there from childhood studies suggesting that expectations premised on developmental models that really emphasize independence may actually, actually alienate families of children with disabilities instead of serving them. For medical providers like genetic counselors and physicians, let's think really critically about how we communicate about prognosis beyond that moment of diagnosis. How can we be proactive and thoughtful in communicating prognosis as a child grows up and enters adulthood, especially in diseases like CF, where the prognosis continues to evolve. How can we embrace a model of prognostic imagination that recognizes how ideas about prognosis impact how people envision their futures and plan their lives? For researchers and advocacy organizations designing studies and providing us clinicians with critical information, how can we consider the views of community stakeholders in the research that we design, carry out, and then communicate? For example, why is median life expectancy this ubiquitous thing in CF? Who is it helping? Who is it hurting? What is the point of this type of aggregate data when the disease is such a spectrum and when portions of the population now have access or lack access to targeted therapies that may really alter survival patterns? For researchers focused on social policy, how can we rethink disability categories that direct things like accommodations and Medicaid eligibility so that they more accurately reflect the variable temporalities of disability? We also know that genetic testing will increasingly identify the pre-symptomatic state of fully penetrant conditions, high disease risk, and the mild spectrum of known conditions. Patients and families facing this type of prognostic information have unique concerns over the lifespan, ranging from over-medicalization to long-term care. How can we ensure that diagnoses create options rather than constrict possibilities? That is, how can we promote policy and societal change to build accessible futures? Thank you so much for your time here today. And thank you so much to the many people who make my work possible. Meghna Mukherjee is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. She studies how fertility and genetic technologies reflect and reproduce social inequities. Her talk is entitled, Making Disability in Prenatal Genetic Testing. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this symposium. My name is Meghna Mukherjee. I am a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. The talk I have planned today will show how disabilities are produced alongside the development of prenatal genetic technologies. I'll present data about wrongful birth and wrongful life cases in the United States over the past 50 years and show how historical legacies are intertwined in the innovation of new technologies. To start, though, I want to ground prenatal genetic technologies in the important history of genomic or precision medicine. So although prenatal genetic technologies serve a useful purpose and can, en and can enable important reproductive decisions, it's critical to understand their historical roots in genomic medicine that has been systematically intolerant and unwanting of disabilities and diverse existences. So while history often associates eugenics with Nazism, eugenics actually finds its roots much earlier, in the early 1900s, across the United States and Europe. So biostatisticians in the early 1900s, including Francis Galton, the famous cousin of Charles Darwin, were deeply interested in making connections between genetics and disease in ways that created social hierarchies. 
They saw those with diseases and disabilities as being genetically inferior, and often combined these ideas with racism to say that some existences were superior to others. And now going into the 1940s, the goal of genetics thus becomes tied with these discriminatory ideas about race and disability. It's around this time that hundreds of genetics clinics and research universities start to spring up across the United States. One of the first was the Dite Institute in Minnesota, founded by Charles Dite, who was himself a, fa a famous eugenicist and a strong proponent of the forced sterilization laws. In addition to eugenics research, at these centers, early genetic counselors would encourage middle class, white, able-bodied families to reproduce based on family pedigree charts. And you can see this depicted in the picture to your left, where a family or marriage counselor advises a couple on reproducing based on their pedigree chart. Moving forward, the, 90s, the 1950s and 1960s saw major findings in genomics research. Scientists learned that humans were typically born with 46 chromosomes, that an extra 21st chromosome could cause Down syndrome. They learned how to genetically identify several conditions, including Turner syndrome, Klinefelter's, and Tay-Sachs disease. And all these findings laid the foundation for genomics medicine as a field. But it did this in a way that also understood the purpose of genetics as preventing disability and difference compared to what was considered so-called normal existence. So when genetic technologies began to be developed around the same time, these same ideas were baked into the way that the technologies were understood and implemented. Importantly, all these developments were happening in the context of forceful control over reproduction. There was an idea that certain people needed to be restricted from reproducing, and these were often women of color or poor white women who were forcibly sterilized. This foundation of precision or genomic medicine also brought expectations about how individuals should manage their health, how society should treat disability, and how the state should participate in these agendas. So where in the past the states would forcefully carry out eugenics agendas themselves, in the United States today, this onus is actually placed more on individuals, almost as a moral responsibility. And this shapes how we understand disability, independence, and what it means to be a productive citizen. So in a highly privatized economic framework like the United States, individuals are more valued if they can participate in higher degrees of productivity. And what this does is frame desired existence as embodied physical and cognitive independence and agency. Others are so assumed to be socially and economically dependent and disabled for not contributing to this type of productivity. This understanding of disability, of course, focuses on the body rather than how social structures can be disabling. And with this, the responsibility shifts onto individuals to privately manage their bodies and their health. We see this in how prenatal genetic testing was introduced as a social obligation, exemplified for its cost effectiveness. In the 1980s, public health messaging stated that with prenatal testing, states could save up to $83,000 per child by preventing Tay-Sachs disease and Hunter syndrome, and up to $66,000 per child in the cases of Edwards syndrome and Down syndrome. So from their inception, prenatal genetic tests were put on this pedestal because they could reduce health burdens on the state and produce more able-bodied citizens for the economy. And today, this responsibility to use testing is routinely included in a pregnant person's re reproductive ex experience. And the framing of disabilities as tragic mistakes or types of existences that are unwanted to be avoided persists. Studies show how people are labeled as irresponsible or irrational for not testing or for choosing to birth a disabled child. And this is specific, especially true for disabled parents who can have their parental rights terminated in 37 US states just for being disabled. A recent study also found that over 70% of ob gyn physicians did not provide disability education materials to patients who had just learned that their fetus has Down syndrome. And in general, people also report receiving more negative information about disabilities following a prenatal diagnosis. These systemic biases represent issues of reproductive and disability justice, which remain concerns in how prenatal genetic testing is implemented today. So with that, I'm going to move on now to the wrongful birth and wrongful life data. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge my wonderful co-author and co-researcher on this project, Zaina Mahmoud, who is in the picture to the far right. Zaina is a research associate at London Women's Clinic, 
and a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter School of Law. And that is, of course, me to her, in the picture to her left. So our study started off by asking how increasing use of prenatal genetic te technologies illuminates changing ideas of what makes for meaningful existence and who should be responsible for reproducing children along these lines. To answer that question, we analyze how courts co-construct engagement with prenatal genetic testing in wrongful birth and wrongful life cases. We use case text, which is a comprehensive database of federal and state cases. We focus on California, which has a long history of eugenics abuses and has also been at the forefront of implementing prenatal genetic testing. Ultimately, we analyzed all wrongful birth and wrongful life cases related to prenatal genetic technologies from 1963 through 2021 at the various court levels in California, as well as landmark cases across other states. So what that meant was in total, we analyzed 37 cases, 16 of which were in California. So what are wrongful birth and wrongful life cases? They're torts. And basically, they're similar to other medical negligence or malpractice claims, where a plaintiff has to establish that the defendant physician fell short of a standard of care and that this failure caused the harm that they sustained. Wrongful life claims are brought by the plaintiff child against the healthcare provider. And the negligence here is the parent's deprivation of the decision to abort or never conceive which led to the child's wrongful life. Wrongful birth claims are brought by the plaintiff parents against a healthcare provider for the deprivation of their own reproductive choice to terminate their pregnancy. So as they adjudicate these wrongful birth and wrongful life cases, courts become important arbiters of how technology should be used in relation to disabilities and how diverse existences are prioritized, valued, or regretted. Before diving into the empirics, let's get a sense for when various prenatal genetic technologies were developed using this timeline visual. So first we can note that amniocentesis, a method to test for fetal chromosomes, made its way into clinics by the 1970s. At the same time, the US Supreme Court passed Roe v. Wade in 1973, federally protecting the right to abortions and allowing more reproductive choice, which of course was recently undone. Then by the 1980s, other methods of prenatal genetic testing were developed, like chorionic villus sampling and maternal serum alpha fetoprotein testing. At this time, major professional societies like the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists also advised that all pregnant people above the age of 35 be offered prenatal genetic testing. Fast forward to 2007, they updated their statement to say that all pregnant people, regardless of age, be offered this testing. And soon after, in 2011, non-invasive prenatal screening or cell-free DNA, often referred to as NIPT, becomes available. It allows people to test for a gamut of genetic conditions, including Down syndrome, using a standard blood draw from the pregnant person. And more recently, we see CAPS, a coalition of major genetics companies lobbying Congress to provide public funds to make prenatal genetic testing routine nationwide. The way these genetic technologies have become a common occurrence in pregnancy has important implications for how we understand disability. Keeping historical roots and disability contexts in mind, we know that the pressures to use testing to select against specific fetuses with genetic conditions and disabilities is systematically present. And these pressures are particularly visible in wrongful birth and wrongful life cases. So what do wrongful birth and life cases tell us about changing views on disability and prenatal genetic testing? Here are some main takeaways to keep in mind as I present the data. So first, although courts underscore the value of all life, they frame disability and genetic conditions as inherently unwanted overall. They promote this expectation that prenatal genetic technologies should help prevent these outcomes, especially as more prenatal technologies are innovated and become an expected part of pregnancy care. Secondly, courts understand disability as something that is embodied, that is caused by a person's physical condition, rather than social or structural contexts. In this way, disability is seen as a private burden. Parents are tasked with dutifully using genetic testing while healthcare providers are penalized for failing to identify genetic conditions. In both cases, disability is seen as harmful to an economically productive or independent life. And finally, 
With more use of prenatal genetic technologies and more conditions identified, courts also grow their list of which genetic conditions and disabilities they consider to be unwanted. And as a result, over time, more conditions and disabilities are transformed into legally recognized injuries that warrant compensation or damages. Throughout, the data will show how prenatal genetic testing has been mobilized towards reproducing and celebrating normative ability. It illuminates how testing, when combined with an ethos that, that values bodily ability for economic productivity, can construct and sustain disability as an unwanted existence. So now diving into the data. The first thing we see is that advancements in genetic technologies increase the expectations that these tools will be used to prevent disabilities and genetic conditions. Prior to prenatal screening, it was really only at birth that a child's genetic conditions could become apparent. However, technological advancements brought with them increased expectations that genetic issues would and should be detected prenatally with courts becoming less tolerant of physicians' errors over time. We see this first with the rapid routinization of amniocentesis in prenatal care, right around the, right around the 1970s when Becker and Schwartz was being litigated. So here, the plaintiff was never advised of amniocentesis to test whether her fetus had Down syndrome, and she was successful in her lawsuit against the physicians for this failure because amniocentesis was routinely available by the late 70s. The courts held that physicians' duties had been expanded to encompass offering parents such tests to prevent genetic conditions and disabilities. Then the Gildner case was crucial in solidifying the supposedly societal interest in the proper performance and interpretation of genetic testing. The court held that, quote, the failure to properly perform or interpret an amniocentesis could cause either the abortion of a healthy fetus or the unwanted birth of a child afflicted with Tay-Sachs disease, framing testing as a, so as a social concern and an expected part of care. Courts later also described doctors or labs testing negligence as legal injuries. In Curlander, which was a very influential case that I will return to several times, the infant plaintiff alleged that defendant testing laboratories caused her birth with Tay-Sachs disease. Here, the lab had mistakenly shown genetic testing results that were negative for Tay-Sachs as well as other conditions, so the child's parents carried their pregnancy to term. The California court ended up granting the infant plaintiff's wrongful life claim, and Justice Jefferson also noted strong public policy considerations in, recognize this in recognizing this breach of duty as the proximate cause of an, in of an injury cognizable at law. So as testing becomes a more routine expectation, courts increasingly consider the birth of a disabled child that results from errors in testing to be a legal harm. And as technological potential advances, there are more, expectation to use, there are more expectations to use testing to prevent these outcomes. Another significant aspect we see in wrongful birth and life cases is the responsibility that parents ought to bear when raising children. This responsibility shifts based on the established standard of prenatal care at a given time, but it always falls on individuals rather than public systems. So in early cases, parental responsibility towards raising children with disabilities is emphasized, despite availability of prenatal technologies. For example, in Park versus Neeson, which took place in 1975, amniocentesis and prenatal diagnostic testing in general was not yet taken up as the contemporary standard of care. It was just, we were just a few years short of this. And as a result, the physicians could not be held responsible for a child's Down syndrome. But as prenatal testing became the care standard, courts hold physicians accountable for operating outside these bounds. This is in large part because of guidelines from federal agencies and professional societies in the late 1970s and, and early 1980s that stated that amniocentesis should be routinely offered to all those older than 35 years. So let's now go back to Curlander, which happened in 1980, where the child was born with Tay-Sachs due to a lab reporting error. The California Court of Appeal recognized that the lab had failed its duty and labeled this a, quote, genetic disaster. Their reasoning suggests that when current technology can reasonably promise an alternative to birthing a disabled child, parental responsibility is less emphasized in the face of physicians or labs wrongdoing. There's also an important emphasis of reproductive autonomy 
after the Supreme Court's landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. Prior to 73, physicians were typically not held responsible for a child's congenital conditions, since nothing could have been done legally to prevent the outcome. But post-Roe, physicians could be negligent and liable for a child's conditions. We see this in Berman v. Allen in 1979, where the defendant physician failed to perform an amniocentesis for a 38-year-old plaintiff mother, resulting in her child being born with Down syndrome. The court awarded the mother emotional damages for her wrongful birth claim because the parents were denied the option to, quote, accept or reject a parental relationship with the child. So after Roe, parental responsibility was seen as being unduly imposed where physicians had failed to inform parents of the option to terminate the fetus following prenatal findings. This might look differently now, of course, depending on which state you're in, given that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Throughout, however, supporting children with disabilities is seen as a private endeavor, either pinned on individual parents or physicians and labs to use testing or provide monetary damages in cases of negligence. Lastly, courts also contend with the question of damages. Should plaintiffs be awarded compensation for children born with disabilities? And although they engage this question differently over time, Courts consistently see disability as a less fulfilling existence, which is then reflected in how they award damages. So early wrongful birth and life cases framed all life as precious and deserving of existence. For example, in Gleitman versus Cosgrove, which took place in 1967, the courts reasoned that Jeffrey, who was born with compromised hearing, sight, speech, and several physical impairments, would still choose disabled life over no life at all. After Roe, however, courts become more open to considering different qualities of existence. So recall the Berman court in 1979, for instance. They described Sharon, who has Down syndrome, as having a, quote, defective and tragic existence. But they maintained that her existence was valuable because they compared it to non-existence. They said that she would be able to love, be loved, feel happiness, and feel, ple and feel pleasure, which was worth any suffering that she might endure. So there was this notion in early cases that life in any form is, all, is always preferable to non-life. However, just a year later in Curlander, it was established that wrongful birth and life cases are not about non-existence, but they were about disabled existence compared to so-called normal existence. And in awarding plaintiffs damages for their child born with Tay-Sachs, Curlander sets into motion this paradigm where disability was seen as wrongful justifying special compensations for parents and children. Then in 1982, Turpin versus Sortini, where the child Joy was born deaf, in this, in this case, the court crystallized this notion, stating that, in, quote, impaired life is not always more valuable than non-existence. They reasoned that special damages could compensate for expenses or anguish of raising a disabled child compared to a so-called normal child. And as recently as 2015, we've seen a court use this reasoning to award plaintiffs $50 million in damages for the wrongful birth of their child, Oliver, with a rare genetic condition. Taken together, these judgments suggest that courts can frame disability as unwanted, and at times a legal harm that is potentially worthy of compensation. It also highlights that parents are ultimately responsible for their disabled children, as monetary damages stand in the place of robust public supports. So why does it matter that prenatal genetic technologies are shaping broader conceptualizations of disability? First and perhaps most salient is this question around abortion and reproductive choices in the United States, especially given that Roe v. Wade was just overturned. Where abortion is not an option, the private sphere, including families, necessarily assumes more responsibility in a context like the U.S. where public child care and disability supports are lacking. We can see privatized health responsibility being further amplified, with even more pressure on parents to use testing. And overall, these waning disability and reproductive protections foreshadow greater health disparities for pregnant people and disabled communities. Next, we can see that the historical legacy around genetics and disability is echoed throughout. Historical roots shape how new prenatal genetic technologies are implemented towards ends that are often intolerant of disabilities. And here we can question if current practices around testing can be shifted so that ableism does not remain the status quo. Finally, all the issues discussed become more pronounced as genetic technologies became, become a routine part of pregnancy care.
We've already seen this happening with non-invasive prenatal testing or NIPT that has been implemented so widely and often without appropriately informing patients. With these innovations being so routinized in healthcare, we need to re-emphasize the need for inclusive structures that are ultimately beneficial to everyone, rather than imposing genetic testing as a way to preclude certain existences. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to continuing this discussion. Sarah Burke Stresser is a lecturer in bioethics at Columbia University who teaches courses on disability and bioethics and mental health ethics. Her doctoral research in anthropology focused on deinstitutionalization and community health care in Italy. Her talk is entitled, How Genetic Reductionism Conceals Social Determinants, The Case of Down Syndrome and COVID-19. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Bergstresser, and I'm a lecturer in bioethics at Columbia University. And today I'm going to talk about um, genetic reductionism and how it can conceal social determinants using, as an example, the case of Down syndrome and COVID-19 in the recent pandemic. Um, all right, so over the period of time, 2020 um, start of the pandemic, it became quite apparent that people with Down syndrome are at higher risk um, to develop COVID-19, to have severe illness and in, to di die of the disease. Um, so, since then, I've noticed the trend that health researchers continue to seek genetic and biological explanations, but very few parallel attempts have been made to address social determinants or to rethink the systems um, that you know, might perpetuate some of this infectious disease in ways that uh, have nothing to do with biology or maybe um, an interaction between biology and, and social conditions. So I want to start with talking about um, combating biological reductionism. Biological reductionism generally would pr prioritize the study of hypothetical biological difference over clear examples of social inequality. And I'll give you some examples of this as I go along. Um, genetic reductionism as a kind of biological reductionism uh, not only reduces humans to genes, so thinking of them as inherently products of genes and not much else, but it actually does and has historically formed the underpinning of eugenic thinking, um, which has um, produced quite a lot of uh, really quite awful and unethical harms over time. So a disability pers uh, studies perspective in this case can really help us to understand how by thinking about in, uh, disability as not something that's an individual defect, not something that's contained within a biological sort of a bound individual or within genes, that we can really see what's going on socially and, and get a better sense of, you know, how can we really understand and ameliorate some of these difficulties that people have been having in the pandemic and in, in broader circumstances. So, Eugenic thinking, um, disability genetics, and scientific racism were very much intertwined in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So right now we tend to think of um, racialized people and categories as being somewhat distinct from disability categories, although of course there are intersectional components as well. But um, at the emergence of eugenic thinking, these things were really intermingled. Um, and the idea was you know, very much so that uh, there was a hierarchy in which people who were de deemed insufficient, whether because of their racialized background or because of a disability, were um, thought to be, for example, um, not as good as other people. And we can see how this has created harms in many different ways. In the case of uh, Down syndrome, which is also uh, trisomy 21, an early diagnostic term was um, Mongolism, so referring to a hypothetical race of people from um, area of uh, present-day Mongolia and that area. And this was very much tied to um, what we now recognize to be very offensive ideas of degeneracy or racial atavism, so an idea that um, uh, some races were had progressed farther than others or um, in sometimes quotes such as, uh, in quotes, Mongolian idiocy, which again, 
is very offensive now, but was actually something that was debated among scientists um, in the 19th and earliest 20th, 20th centuries. So a problem with eugenic thinking is that even though we don't talk about these things explicitly and in fact disavow them, a lot of the things um, such as assumptions or tests or diagnostic tools actually carry vestiges of this history um, because they really haven't been examined. They've just been carried along. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to talk about here is this idea of biological deficit as an underlying and inherent model for disability um, and things like Down syndrome. So the underlying assumption is that there is a biological deficit and what is that? Rather than starting before that and saying, you know, what is what are the problems um, without immediately assuming that a biological deficit must be the most important and, and the first thing to, to think about. So a disability studies perspective can really help us understand, first of all, how individualizing disability, um, you know, not only uh, misses the point in a lot of ways, but it also allows social systems and policymakers to basically offload responsibility onto individuals. So, um, you know, if resources, if policymakers um, can argue that resources shouldn't be given out because of something like perhaps, quote, individual responsibility or individual defect, then that allows really the misappropriation of social resources to causes that, you know, they really should not be destined to. Um, myths and preconceived notions are also used often in science and in policy for hypothesis formation. And in a lot of cases, um, you know, this can lead to exclusion and the ignoring of a lot of social determinants in favor of just assumptions about genes and um, how everything should really be traced back to genes. So the example here is uh, COVID-19. Institutions, particularly residential institutions, um, quite a great deal of individuals with um, developmental disabilities and such as Down syndrome um, are still in uh, residential closed institutions, even though there's an assumption that really was something of the past, it's not completely past. And in addition to that, a lot of these people, although we think of Down syndrome and other sorts of disabilities as conditions of children, you know, people are in these institutions for their whole lives. And so a great number of them are actually in, for example, in uh, COVID terms, you know, very high risk ages. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about a study in New York, which studied uh, COVID-19 outcomes among people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in residential services. And in this study, they found that the median age, so people in these institutions was actually 57 years. So the assumption that this is um, a place where children might be is actually um, quite wrong. And in fact, shows us that the age here puts a lot of individuals in this higher risk age category. Um, they also found that highest association with uh, COVID-19 infection in these cases were first of all Down syndrome, and other things that we know about, increased age, kidney disease, and then finally, um, larger number of residents in a facility. So these closed facilities, the more people who are closed together in these facilities, the more risk there is for any one of these individuals to contract COVID-19. Um, another really important study was done in the UK, and it was a very large study of 8 million people. Um, and they did some adjustments um, using statistical techniques adjusted for a lot of factors to see you know, what are the components that uh, influence uh, COVID-19 related death. So in this case, um, it's death, it's this particular outcome. Um, and something that's fairly striking that they found is that in their study, um, over a period of time of approximately six months, uh, individuals with Down syndrome were approximately 25 times more likely to die of COVID-19 than uh, compare people that they were compared with. So, um, you know, this is a, a fairly specific statistic, but it really does indicate that this is an extremely significant difference, that this is not uh, something that's likely uh, to be due to chance. This is, you know, a very big finding. Some other things that they found were that 
when they adjusted for all sorts of risk factors that we know a lot about by now, so age, sex, ethnicity, BMI, um, home care residency. So um, again, they're adjusting for the social situation here. They found that there was still a strong association between Down syndrome diagnosis specifically and death from COVID-19 and also hospitalization, so if not death. Um, so this does suggest that there might be some underlying biological factors that are important and need to be researched. But they also found, again, after adjusting for all of these other things, that um, death from COVID-19 is strongly associated with living in a residential or nursing home, so a congregate facility where people are living. And this is regardless of what their biological diagnosis would be or their age, et cetera. Um, and this risk is actually something around um, the same sorts of significance as chronic kidney disease on dialysis, diabetes, and chemotherapy. So some fairly well-known and um, strong associations. And so this also suggests that social environmental factors are incredibly important and not trivial um, because this is showing that once they've controlled for a lot of biological and demographic factors, this residential setting component still makes a very big difference. So, um, you know, a lot of these responses to understanding this risk between um, COVID-19 and, and Down syndrome, you know, th there are some good things that can come about this. It can promote justice and equity. Um, people have, after this, advocated for vaccine eligibility before others um, based on higher risk and need. But it can also lead to injustice and disparity. So, as I've said before, individualizing the problem um, and, you know, making assumptions that people uh, won't be able to follow protocols without actually, um, you know, taking the time to investigate what, whether this is actually the case or not. Another thing that's happened is that um, there was quite a lot of attention paid to COVID close clusters, for example, in the U.S., but the social importance, let's say, of different places um, was very heavily indicated in how they reported and how much attention was paid to them. So if you were paying attention to the New York Times, they had a lot of data counts. Um, nursing homes, prisons, colleges had their own, you know, fairly important sections. And then they had another section which was called originally less noticed coronavirus clusters and then later other clusters. So this really shows that, you know, even in the reporting, it's acknowledged uh, that, you know, people are not paying attention to this. And then the reporting itself is also not paying attention to it. Um, you know, in November of 2020, so really uh, when the pandemic was um, a very serious period, um, in this less noticed clusters area, there were at least 16 developmental centers. And that is a term that usually comes, that usually denotes um, a residential center for individuals with uh, developmental disabilities. And there were quite a number of clusters, at least 16 at the time. And there was one um, in Illinois that had 356 cases at once, which was at the time similar to the highest nursing home case. And there was a lot of press given to nursing homes and almost none given to developmental centers. Um, of course, the numbers have changed since then, but this was at the height of the pandemic. So, you know, biological reductionism in policy, you know, what does this mean for policy? Um, biological reductionism leads to misdirected policy priorities in emergency situations. Um, and, you know, as I've just pointed out, it was clear that there were a lot of social factors and institutional factors that were uh, resulting in really large um, and serious clusters of COVID. Um, so the problem with this is that instead of immediately focusing resources on alleviating this immediate problem, so helping people to not get sick or hospitalized or die, there was uh, a rush of resources into um, people who are looking for genetic correlates of why Down syndrome is associated with higher risk of COVID-19. Now, I understand, of course, that not everybody is going to do the same sort of research. Not everybody could, you know, change what they do. Geneticists couldn't go out and start doing social research. Um, but 
you know, it really shows an underpinning of, you know, how scarce resources are distributed in uh, science and policy, particularly in the U.S. You know, there's there's certainly a preference to prioritize um, genetic and biological causality, and really to ignore uh, things like social causality, even when it's actively uh, in an emergency situation. So. Um, Biological and social determinants are not separately. Um, it, there's some fallacy that it's a nature versus nurture debate. And, you know, that is not true. Nature and nurture, as you might say, or biology and social and environmental determinants always act together to produce all real world outcomes. Um, but there is a disproportionate research focus on biological pathways. Um, and there's really just not as much uh, focus on social and environmental determinants, even when it's obvious that these things are incredibly important in an outcome. Now, it's not to say that uh, genetic and physiological research isn't important. It just needs to be done in conjunction with social determinant research so that you can really understand the full picture. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about how preconceived notions um, in this case about um, Down syndrome can uh, drive, you know, uh, problems in hypothesis generation and, and priority setting. So um, there is a preconceived notion that Down syndrome is only a disease of children. Um, but as we've seen before, you know, the real world circumstances are not that at all. Um, in fact, you know, in the past, there certainly was a much shorter life expectancy for individuals with Down syndrome, um, which might seem as though it's a biological cause. But in reality, when social things changed, this lifespan increased dramatically. So um, around the 1970s, quite a lot of social ideas changed and social conditions changed as a result. Um, so deinstitutionalization, um, Closure of some of these huge institutions happened around the 1970s, and a lot of it followed um, the Willowbrook Exposé, where people you know, saw the terrible conditions in these places. But another thing that happened was that um, before, in the 1960s, it was actually, um, even though um, surgery, pediatric surgery was possible, it was often uh, considered that an individual with Down syndrome who did have uh, perhaps a heart condition wasn't uh, a good candidate for surgery. And um, as this quote on the screen um, shows, I'll read it to you. It says, as surgery became more effective in the 1960s, it was widely acknowledged that cardiac abnormalities commonly associated with congenital conditions, such as the high prevalence of teratology of fellow and children born with Down syndrome, so heart problems, were not selected for surgery. So um, a shorter lifespan was a direct result of uh, people being chosen uh, not uh, to have life-saving surgery. Now, this is an image that shows primarily that around 1970, the mean and median lifespan of individuals with Down syndrome increased incredibly uh, fast and dramatically. So in around 1970, the median was you know, around five years old and the mean was perhaps uh, 12 years old. By 2010, the median um, lifespan was over 50 and the mean was around 50. So um, in the period between 1970 and 2010, um, biological underpinnings of Down syndrome certainly didn't change that fast. What changed were social underpinnings, including institutions, and a consideration that these individuals should be eligible for life-saving surgery, um, just like everybody else. So um, one final thing I want to talk about a little bit is unexamined exceptionalism. Um, and this goes again back to the idea that individuals in certain categories are inherently different biologically. So the assumption starts with an idea that they're different and that this difference is deficit. Um, you know, there was quite a lot of focus, again, during the COVID-19 pandemic on the idea that individuals with um, intellectual disabilities and Down syndrome would not be able to follow masking protocols. Um, and, you know, certainly there should be uh, concern with any group and their ability to uh, 
follow these protocols, but the problem was that it started with an assumption of deficit. Um, and, be, you know, why I say um, exceptionalism is that while these debates were going on and arguments were being made that individuals um, would need to be monitored more closely, um, individuals Down syndrome, at the same time, the general public was um, doing an incredibly bad job following masking protocols. Um, this is an image that shows that huge swaths of the country um, under the criteria of chance, all five people are wearing masks in five random encounters. Huge swaths of, of the country of the US are about 0% to 30%. Um, there are areas, mostly in large cities, um, the East Coast, California, uh, New Mexico, uh, Texas border area, which are in the 60 to even 100%. But you know, if we're going to um, start from an idea of deficit for individuals with disability and not understand that also that, you know, these people might actually be better than the general public. We're making policy making from an assumption of genetic and biological deficit rather than actually understanding what's going on. So how can we do non-rejectionist genetic research? Um, genetic research just need not erase social determinants. Um, and a practice of statistically controlling for social situations so that you can have a clearer genetic or biological outcome, you know, might make your um, paper look better. But in reality, it means that you're capturing less of the real world. And, um, you know, scientifically, you're hiding things from your research that, in fact, you really should be paying attention to if what you really want to find out is what's going on in the situation. Um, reductionism and reductionist approaches erase obvious connections between COVID-19 infection and under-resourced residential facilities with carceral components, by which I mean sometimes they are locked. People cannot choose to leave even if they are at very high risk for an infection. Um, and another problem was that preventing uh, family contact during this period of time is actually the sort of situation that leads to um, abuse and neglect in this sort of facility. Um, and as we saw in the past with Willowbrook, uh, the less visible these places are, the more risk there might be, especially in times that are very frustrating and under-resourced. Um, oftentimes the family members are the ones who are paying attention to the conditions. So a few conclusions. Biological reductionism and medicalization. So you know, the tendency to make everything into a medical diagnosis rather than a, an aspect of difference continue to be used to conceal or deny systemic structural inequality for individuals with Down syndrome and other disabilities. Um, so instead of examining problems such as uh, locked residential facilities, uh, which lead to infection clusters, um, you know, a focus on, well, what's the genetic difference actually conceals these real world immediate problems. Um, inequality is routinely normalized based on presumed or hypothetical biological differences, while structural and social constraints are often dismissed or ignored. Again, you know, making um, a distraction away from real policy changes that really do need to be made. Um, second conclusions. Awareness of social determinants of disease is really necessary for disability justice, equity, and inclusion. Um, and genetic reductionism threatens the integrity of scientific research since it relies on preconceived notions for hypothesis generation. And a lot of these, again, are unexamined vestiges of eugenic thinking, even though the scientists, you know, think uh, making these hypotheses, I would say certainly in most cases don't know this, they don't realize this. But because they don't realize this, um, they think of it as a neutral assumption rather than something that really needs to be examined. Um, and this slows the understanding of real world complexity and the interactions between genes and environment. So thank you very much. Um, and my contact is, my email is up on the screen. Nina Rosner is a postdoctoral fellow in the NIH Department of Bioethics. Her research is focused on the ethics of reproductive health policy, particularly in relation to disability, genomics, and emerging technologies. Her talk is entitled, 
genetics at the intersection of reproductive justice and disability rights, rhetoric and practice. Hi, my name is Nina Reisner. I'm a fellow with the uh, Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health. We're an independent academic department within the NIH Clinical Center. So before I start, I'll just say that the views expressed in this talk are my own. Uh, they don't represent the position or policy of the NIH, uh, DHHS, or US government. So since prenatal diagnostics first became available in the 1970s, uh, information available to prospective parents has been used to justify reducing access to abortion care and restricting reproductive choice. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on abortion restrictions called genetic selective abortion bans. And those are bans that prohibit only abortions that are sought because of a prenatal diagnosis of disability or genetic abnormality. So a close reading of the text of these bans and the rhetoric surrounding them uh, reveal that genetic selective abortion bans really weaponize uh, genetic testing uh, to advance re abortion restrictions um, in ways that are ultimately at odds with the interests of the disability community. In a post dobbs world, uh, this nexus of reproductive policy and disability rights has never been uh, more important. Um, we see deep red states passing extreme abortion restrictions, um, and the debate is going to move to more moderate states. Um, and abortion activists are going to have to win over uh, people who are otherwise supportive of a more pro-choice agenda. There are also several state constitutions that prevent outright abortion bans, in which case selective abortion bans can become tools uh, to support those constitutional protections. Um, and this is all happening at the same time that we're poised to see a radical expansion in the kinds of information available through prenatal testing. So to analyze these abortion bans in the disability rights context, I'll first provide an overview of prenatal genetic testing and genetic selective abortion bans. I'll then outline the arguments used to support genetic selective abortion bans. I provide an analysis of the rhetorical and practical issues with those bans and then sort of wrap up with what this all means for disability rights. So beginning with a brief history, genetic selective abortion bans, as I mentioned, uh, prohibit abortions sought based on a prenatal diagnosis of disability or genetic abnormality. They're structured around penalties for physicians. Um, so these laws are not going to uh, punish women who are pursuing abortions, um, but physicians who violate these laws might be subject to fines, um, even jail time, um, libel and civil actions, and maybe subject to professional discipline, um, including losing their license to practice. And over the past decade, you've seen 30 of these bills introduced in state legislatures. Um, six have passed. Prior to Dobbs, most of those bills were enjoined, so they were not in effect. Um, but we're going to start seeing, probably over the next year, um, different laws go into effect. So I'll note um, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm focusing on bans that prohibit abortions based on disability or genetic abnormality, um, pretty broadly defined. Um, there are states that have passed similar legislation that ban only abortions sought on the basis of Down syndrome. So I'll give a brief overview of prenatal testing. Um, so you can see that interest in these bans on the part of anti-abortion advocates has really moved in lockstep with advances in prenatal testing over time. So beginning in the early 1970s, uh, new diagnostic technologies gave prospective parents uh, the opportunity to learn genetic information about future offspring um, really for the first time. Uh, advances over the following decades uh, made prenatal testing increasingly common, uh, used to identify genetic disorders and fetal malformations, and by the early 2000s, um, we're seeing these technologies really become a routine part of prenatal care. Um, and that's reflected by that 2007 uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommendation um, that all women are screened in pregnancy and not just um, those that would historically be considered high risk, um, things like uh, older age. So a sea change really comes in 2011 um, with the arrival of non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT. Um, and this offers screening for chromosomal abnormalities and certain inherited disorders um, early in pregnancy with just a routine blood draw. Um, and I'll note that that is screening and not diagnostic. 
And by 2016, um, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, as well as American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, recommend that NIPT be offered to all pregnant women. Outside of the clinical context, um, commercial providers are already offering NIPT to screen for a growing number of genetic conditions. Looking towards the future, uh, new means of genetic analysis are set to radically increase the amount of genetic information available to prospective parents. Um, this is going to include information about less serious conditions, non-medical traits, um, things like height, or you can imagine sexual orientation. Um, so moving to genetic selective abortion bans, how they develop, um, going all the way back to the 1970s, the first reason-based abortion ban was based on the sex of the fetus. Um, so prohibiting abortions um, based on the termination of sex. Those were only ever passed in two states. Um, but we see a resurgence of interest that doesn't come until 2008. So that's just one year after the ACOG recommendation about prenatal screening um, and anti-abortion groups began discussing abortion prohibitions based on disability and genetic abnormality. Um, at that time, it really was just discussion. It wasn't a serious policy priority, um, but sort of the first time you're really hearing about it. And then in 2011, same year that NIPT becomes clinically available, uh, the anti-abortion group Americans United for Life I released the first model legislation banning genetic selective abortions. Um, the following year, Missouri was the first seat to take up that legislation. Um, the first ban was passed by North Dakota in 2013. And again, um, we see uh, what I think is a reaction to expanded uptake of NIPT in 2016 um, with that recommendation, which um, I think mirrored sort of an expansion of uptake generally. Um, 2016 was the year with the single most um, ban bills introduced into state legislatures prior to 2021. Um, so now that we're on the precipice of this expansion of genetic information available via prenatal testing, um, we're seeing new record for most bills introduced. So looking more closely now at what the bans actually say, um, I'm going to use this example text from Indiana's law. Um, it's generally representative of laws proposed and passed in other states. And the key provision prohibits a physician from knowingly performing an abortion the pregnant woman is seeking solely on the basis of a diagnosis or potential diagnosis of Down syndrome or any other disability. So I want to point out two parts here. First, is this incredibly expansive language. So we'll get any other disability. It's defined as any defect, disease, or disorder that is genetically inherited. And other laws use terms like genetic abnormality or abnormal gene expression that are even more broad. And then second, even more expansive, um, the law applies in the case of a diagnosis or a potential diagnosis, meaning the presence of some risk factors indicating that a health problem may occur. So this is really important in view of technologies like NIPT, um, which as I noted, is a screening test. So it's not actually diagnostic, but it would still fall within the scope of these laws. And then when you think about the future, um, we're gonna see things like polygenic risk scores, which would only provide um, information that's roughly predictive of a fetal trait. Um, but the way this law is written and other laws similar, um, it's going to be broad enough to encompass that kind of information. So I want to um, sort of break down the disability rights rhetoric that's been used to promote these bills um, and more precisely delineate the arguments that are being used. Um, and this is based on documents from the legislative process, uh, subsequent litigation, testimony from committee hearings, uh, statements by bill sponsors, all sorts of things. Um, and the first argument I will uh, talk about is the discrimination argument. Uh, this argument claims that each genetic selective abortion is an act of discrimination against a particular fetus. So every individual abortion offensive to an individual fetus. Proponents of this view um, talk about GSA bans um, in comparison to laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
um, sort of talk about them like they're just a logical extension of kind of anti-discrimination law that already exists in this country. Underlying this argument uh, is the claim that when a genetic selective abortion occurs, a fetus is being deprived of its right to be born on the basis of disability. Next is the expressivist argument, uh, which posits that genetic selective abortions are sending a message that the lives of those with disabilities are less valuable than others. Furthermore, um, if states fail to ban genetic selective abortions, they're essentially endorsing that message. Um, and in doing so, they're stigmatizing disability and harming disabled individuals in the disability community at large. So you can see that sort of goes a step further than the individual abortion and individual fetus. And finally is the eugenics argument. Um, this argument frames genetic selective abortions as a means to eliminate disability entirely. Um, it very frequently is employing analogies to eugenic practices of the 20th century. Um, the idea is that termination rates following diagnosis of a fetal disability will be so high uh, that you'll see virtually no births of babies with disabilities and um, the disabled population will dwindle. Of the three arguments, this is the critical legal argument um, with states claiming that preventing eugenics is a compelling state interest advanced by these bans. Um, so particularly um, if you're looking at states where it's a constitu uh, constitutional issue, this is gonna be really important. There's also sort of a secondary version of this argument um, that views selection against disability as opening the door to selection on the basis of all kinds of other traits, including those non-medical traits I mentioned and ushering in this future of designer babies. And this fear is directly related to advances in prenatal testing, um, which again are poised to provide information about those kinds of traits that we don't currently have access to. So these two parts of the eugenics argument sort of get tied together. So having identified those three core arguments, uh, I wanna critically analyze the rhetoric and see if it actually aligns with the disability rights agenda. Um, as I'll explore in this section, even where arguments uh, really resemble arguments made by disability rights advocates. Ultimately, these bans just can't be justified solely on the basis of disability rights. Um, and ultimately, they frequently undermine uh, disability rights and are at odds with the goals and values of that movement. So going back again to the discrimination argument, the uh, claim is that genetic selective abortions are discriminatory because, again, the individual fetus is being denied something it is entitled to, and um, it's being denied on the basis of disability. And so we can see in this example, um, what is being denied is the opportunity to be born. So unless that right to be born um, arises only in the case of a genetic selective abortion, um, a claim that is not advanced by, um, to my knowledge, any proponents of genetic selective abortion bans, um, it would logically extend to all fetuses. It doesn't make sense that you would only have a right to be born after you're discriminated against. Um, so to prohibit abortions only when a fetus is targeted um, on the basis of disability would be denying every other fetus protection of that right. Instead, the discrimination argument um, really seems to be focused more on motivation behind the decision to terminate, not the termination, um, which brings to mind hate crime laws. Um, but unlike these laws, hate crime laws reserve punishment for cases in which the underlying conduct is itself criminal, so not just the motivation. Um, ultimately, it really looks like these laws are kind of a backdoor to making the anti-abortion personhood argument. Um, and you can make a weaker version of that argument, um, but that would still require that the fetus has some moral and legal standing that allows it to have a claim against the person um, which it is just stating. So next is the problem of exacerbating expressivist harm. The expressivist message of genetic selective abortions is driven in large part by the perceived motivations behind those abortions. By removing genetic selective abortions from the larger context of social, political, economic, and individual factors that we know influences decisions, 
Uh, the rhetoric in support of genetic selective abortion bans characterizes them as motivated by animus or intolerance of disability. And so by strengthening that association of selective abortions with negative attitudes towards disability, the rhetoric might actually worsen that perception and worsen the expressive harm. So turning to the eugenics argument, um, I want to talk about that comparison to 20th century eugenics. Um, and proponents rely heavily on comparisons with that 20th century eugenics movement in order to frame the bans as anti-eugenic measures. The invocation is really emotionally powerful, um, bringing to mind the atrocities of the Holocaust and you know, stateside efforts at so-called racial betterment. Um, so it's a really powerful emotional argument. Um, but genetic selective abortions today just um, have little in common with those eugenic practices. So first, genetic selective abortions are the private decisions of individual women they're not a part of a centralized campaign to reduce or eradicate disability in the population. That's not to dismiss the effect on the incidence of disability. More selective abortions means fewer births of babies with disabilities. Um, and disability rights have uh, advocates have raised those concerns. Um, in response, advocates have focused their concerns on the ways in which a genetic testing is offered how results are communicated, and that's something I will touch on in greater detail later. Uh, but proponents of these bans really have not demonstrated any interest in uh, policies to address those issues. So none of these laws um, were introduced as part of a disability rights agenda. They were not introduced um, in conjunction with policies that would address those other issues. Furthermore, the rhetoric used by proponents of genetic selective abortion bans uh, often contradicts the view that preserving disability in the population is itself a valuable form of diversity. They frequently make references to treatments and cures for disabilities. Um, and that really seems to reveal that the primary concern is not the prospect of eliminating disability, um, but abortion as a means of doing so. So next, I want to talk about um, just that expansive nature of these laws. Um, these genetic selective abortion bans encompass all sorts of genetic conditions. Um, genetic condition is not synonymous with disability, particularly taking a more socially oriented view of disability. Uh, the genetic basis of condition is really irrelevant. Um, so there are all kinds of conditions that might be considered disabilities that are not genetic. On the other hand, there are all sorts of genetic conditions that we would not consider disabilities. Um, and these laws don't distinguish disability from any number of other identifiable genetic abnormalities, um, including those that would only be predictive of future traits. And whether referring to disabilities or genetic conditions generally, uh, the laws encompass conditions with really widely varying prognoses in terms of suffering, and morbidity or early childhood mortality um, and adverse events for the mother. And the rhetoric used really obscures those differences um, in ways that are particularly important in the context of disability rights. And an example of this, and it's everywhere you look in these debates, um, is that advocates for genetic selective abortion ban really primarily talk about Down syndrome. Um, and they tend to present this idealized vision of raising a child with disabilities. And that represents the experiences of many families and it's important, um, but it ignores the reality of life with all kinds of other disabilities and the challenges that are encountered by many individuals with disabilities and their families. So the final um, rhetorical and textual issue I wanna to touch on is the law's purported focus on heritability. Going straight to the legislative text, most bills limit their scope to genetically inherited disabilities um, while also explicitly listing non-heritable conditions as examples of covered diagnoses. The tension in these laws in that text uh, reflects tension between the different arguments used to justify them. The discrimination and expressivist arguments apply with equal force to heritable and non-heritable disabilities. Um, so based on those arguments, it doesn't really make sense to limit bans to inherited traits. The eugenics argument, on the other hand, 
um, is most forceful when you're talking about uh, heritable conditions, um, especially as proponents explicitly cite the threat that disabilities would be irreversibly eliminated from the population. And so inclusion of conditions like Down syndrome that are overwhelmingly sporadic undermines that central legal justification um, that relies on the urgency of that threat. So now I will move to the practical implications of these laws. Um, and I will preface this section by recognizing it is quite evident from the drafting of these laws that they would be incredibly difficult to enforce. Um, as I mentioned, they have not, um, most of them have not been in effect um, because of Roe. Um, so we haven't really seen this in action, um, but penalties require proof of the woman's reason for seeking an abortion and proof that the provider knew of that reason. Um, so that's going to be generally pretty difficult to prove. A lot of the laws require that it was the sole reason. Um, but the effect of the laws are still very real um, for reproductive health care, for disability rights. Even the threat of litigation has a chilling effect, um, especially in the really uncertain legal landscape that we're in right now. So one major consequence is that these laws will reduce access to reproductive health care and disrupt uh, the important doctor-patient relationship. Uh, the quote here comes from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, it says that reason bans represent gross interference in the patient-physician relationship, creating a system in which patients and physicians are forced to withhold information or outright lie. So in particular, when it comes to prenatal testing and pregnancy terminations, this can leave a lot of patients in the dark without access to proper care. Um, so healthcare providers might be hesitant to provide abortions to someone who has received a diagnosis of a fetal disability or has screened high risk out of an abundance of caution because they don't want to be later accused of having known something. Um, and this is gonna broadly curtail access to abortion. Providers are also going to be hesitant to discuss the results of screening and diagnostic tests um, for fear of receiving information that would put them in the position of denying care or violating the law should the patient decide to pursue an abortion. And then on the other side of that, you have women who are going to be deterred from seeking information and guidance, um, whether that's from doctors, genetic counselors, um, out of fear that they might be denied the option to terminate if they reveal something about their motivation um, in those conversations. And we know that access to professional counseling is associated with lower rates of termination um, following diagnosis of a disability. Um, more information about raising a child with a disability um, has a potential to alleviate a lot of the uncertainty, um, misconceptions, and fear uh, that factor into some decisions to terminate a pregnancy. Furthermore, uh, arguments used to support these bans suggest room for much more sweeping restrictions on reproductive care. Both the discrimination argument and the eugenics argument really apply at all stages of pregnancy and providing justification for abortion restrictions um, from conception. Um, and this is another example of how the bans can be used to circumvent um, both legal and political barriers to really um, extremist abortion bans. And the failure of the eugenics argument to draw a clear line between abortion and contraceptive use, um, both of which might affect the prevalence of disability in aggregate, um, is particularly notable given that both played a central role in the eugenic history um, that is so frequently referenced. So you can repurpose almost the exact eugenics argument articulated by um, genetic selective abortion ban supporters and use that to justify restrictions, not just on contraceptive use, but other reproductive care um, and genetic technologies, things like pre-implantation screening, in the case of in vitro fertilization, or even something like uh, carrier screening. So going beyond the impact of genetic selective abortion bans themselves, um, even just the use of that disability rights rhetoric to justify them has significant implications for the ways in which women access and interact with prenatal testing I and mean, ultimately can act as a barrier to passing policies that enjoy broad support in the disability community. 
So this is only intended to be a rough account um, of the concerns that many disability rights advocates share about prenatal genetic testing. Um, sort of the overarching concern is the effect of prenatal testing becoming a routine part of prenatal care, um, leading more women to undergo testing without consideration of its implications and without adequate information or even um, out of pressure. Coinciding lack of patient-centered counseling um, might cause abortion to become the default response to a diagnosis of disability. And then that combination, the presumption of testing and termination um, could ultimately stigmatize the choice not to test or the choice not to terminate um, if it comes to be um, sort of views that those decisions are um, a choice not to avoid disability when you had the option to. And these concerns also relate to tension uh, between the disability community and genetic counseling profession, stemming from early associations between genetic counseling and eugenics. So some concerns persist that genetic counseling as a profession exhibits bias against disability. In part, disability rights advocates uh, worry that a tendency to describe disability in terms of medical and functional impairments um, both within genetic counseling and more broadly, um, without information on more positive aspects of disability and available resources may really deny women uh, the opportunity to make a fully informed decision about uh, raising a child with a disability. So while the disability community um, generally shares uh, those concerns about the consequences of prenatal genetic testing, there's a divide in support for genetic selective abortion bans as a means to address those concerns, um, but the division is not symmetric. The academic disability rights community has been very forceful in rejecting bans as an appropriate policy response. Um, in addition to the concerns I've already discussed, um, there's a lot of concern in the academic community that these bans interfere with other ethical prerogatives um, like bodily autonomy. Where you see the divide a bit more pronounced is among disability advocates um, who articulated a broader range of views. Um, but I think it's important to note that none of these bans have been drafted or introduced by disability advocates. Very few advocacy organizations have voiced public support for bans. I mean, you have seen pushback from a lot of advocacy groups. And these bans and the rhetoric surrounding them don't exist in a vacuum. People's views around reproduction and disability are frequently tied up in their political identity. Um, the way that the rhetoric around these bans um, frames uh, the issue really pits disability rights against abortion access such that you can be for one or the other, but you can't be for both. And it presents this false choice for people. These arguments also undermine reproductive justice more broadly, um, because not only are they denying women the choice of whether or not to carry pregnancies, um, they're treating all of the social, economic, and political circumstances around reproduction as just irrelevant to this issue. Um, it presupposes um, a really traditional view of family um, that ignores all kinds of non-traditional family structures, different individual needs and desires, um, and all these things in the context of reproduction. And rather than some sort of collective action, the future of disability rights is really placed on the backs of individual women um, without concern for an opportunity for them to determine for themselves uh, whether, when, and how to have a family. So by politicizing disability rights, uh, the legislative focus on genetic selective abortion bans disrupts coalition building among constituencies that agree on a range of policies. So um, following are a few of the policy priorities put forth by disability rights groups um, that have also been endorsed by all sorts of stakeholders, physicians, genetic counselors, reproductive justice advocates, um, among others. So at a very basic level, providing more women with access to high quality genetic counseling could go a long way toward combating concerns about prenatal testing. Expanding high quality counseling um, also calls for reforms within the genetic counseling profession, um, including training that better equips counselors to support patients in 
combat misperceptions about disability. Um, and emphasis on patient-centered counseling can also provide a more holistic understanding of different diagnoses. And I put that in the context of families, individual circumstances. And one of the most straightforward ways to advance disability rights and uh, make the decision to raise a child with disability possible for more families, that would be to provide additional support as those families face barriers like increased medical costs and caregiving needs. As it stands today, many people uh, may not feel like they even have much of a choice when it comes to terminating a pregnancy, um, not out of prejudice against disability, but for lack of necessary resources. So these are just a few examples of targeted policies um, that both support those with disabilities and increase the ability of individuals to determine their own reproductive future. So despite rhetoric aligning the campaign for genetic selective abortion bans with the disability rights movement, um, the arguments and practical implications of the push for these bans um, are much more closely aligned with an anti-abortion agenda. Uh, the rhetoric and legal strategy weaponizes genetics, um, in particular advances in prenatal genetic testing and to promote abortion restrictions in ways that pose a real risk to the disability rights movement. Um, the push for these bans disrupts political coalitions, it deprioritizes popular policies that we know would make raising a child with disability a um, more feasible option for families, and we know it would help the disability community. Um, and it's those kinds of policies that are more likely than bans to actually reduce the number of selective abortions, um, if that's your end goal. So it's developments in prenatal testing um, poised to dramatically increase the amount of genetic information available to prospective parents in the near future. Uh, the debate over genetic selective abortion bans and use of disability rights rhetoric in service of restrictions on reproductive rights is likely just beginning. So it's not sufficient to dismiss these bans as ineffective or the rhetoric is frivolous. We have to take very seriously uh, the threat that this strategy poses, and we have to protect reproductive justice alongside disability rights. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the Q&A. This is Christopher Donahue speaking. It is my honor to introduce Eric Garcia as the moderator for the next question and answer session. Eric Garcia is the senior Washington correspondent for The Independent. He is the author the of author. We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation which was released in August, 2021 by Mariner Books. Garcia describes We Are Not Broken as his quote, love letter to autistic people. He describes how autistic people have been forced to navigate a world, this is a quote, have been forced to navigate a world where all the roadside, road signs are written in another language. He previously worked at the Washington Post, The Hill, Roll Call, National Journal, and Market Watch. You can follow him on Twitter at Eric M. Garcia. Over to you, Eric. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rebecca, Magna, Sarah, and Nina for your uh, incredible questions. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my questions brief and more just try to facilitate conversation and interchange between all three of you be, uh, or all, all four of you because uh, nobody ever said, oh, the moderator did such a great job. Um, but I, I mean, I think one of the things that I that I noticed when watching your lectures and, and, and kind of getting uh, prepared for this is that um, Nina and um, Nina, Megna, Rebecca, and Sarah, it seems like a lot of the focus when it comes to eugenics seems to be focused on genetic determinants and not on social determinants on how this create on whether life is quote unquote worthy or worth living for people with disabilities. What do you make of the way that we measure um, quality of life and how a lot of it, we tend to focus just on the genetic factor, not on the social factor. And anybody can Um, I mean, I can start. It, it, it speaks to what I was talking about a little yes, bit. Exactly. I mean, I, I think that, again, um, there are a lot of uh, 
assumptions embedded in the idea of what makes a good life. And you know, I'm sure you know this. So the, the idea of quality of life as measured externally um, emphasizes a lot of things that perhaps in a capitalist society is productivity or sort of speed production. Um, and I think that we often conflate the idea of quality of life with uh, sort of uh, images of what somebody should be doing for others rather than actually asking people you know, about their own quality of life, but also understanding that what they are saying is indicative of the quality of life that they have within the social circumstances that surround them as well. So, you know, I, um, I think that the biological reductionism very much goes hand in hand with a, a productivity uh, mindset. And, and it's easy to think that science and a lot of other social and cultural forces are separate. But I think that, you know, if you look at them closely, you, you realize that they're not at all. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yeah, I can jump in. I think, you know, largely what I was talking, um, you know, in, in my talk, it was also really focused on this definition of qualifying what makes for a good life based on, as Sarah was saying, this understanding of productivity, um, a particular understanding of independence, a particular understanding of agency, um, and very narrowly defined around what our, um, you know, normative so like social and economic involvement, um, the expectations around what that involvement needs to look like. And I think there's also this tendency of when we um, talk about genetic conditions or talk about at least those that are diagnosed prenatally is kind of discussing, right, the worst case scenario. That's kind of what I think a lot of providers will gravitate towards in terms of asking patients, well, are you okay with the worst case scenario? Um, and that is a really uh, problematic and um, hurtful way to present what like the, the varying ways in which a condition or a disability can present itself. And I think Rebecca, your, your talk was so perfect on that of like the changing nature of some of these experiences and kind of holding it static to a worst case scenario and um, judging life quality or you know what makes a worthwhile existence based on those types of definitions uh, doesn't take us very far and continues to treat disability as this very permanent, very static experience. Anybody else before I go? Because I don't want to make sure I want to make sure I'm not interrupting anybody. Uh, I'll just add okay, that leads me to Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead. Just to sort of mention the flip side of that worst case scenario. Um, when you hear people talk about the best case scenario, it is then defined in terms of someone who is productive and someone who is valuable to other people rather than intrinsically valuable themselves um, and not talking about quality of life in the way that people talk about their own quality of life. Um, so it's sort of whether you're talking about best case or worst case defined um, and terms that I think are really um, problematic and are not useful. Thank you. Um, on top of that, sorry, I was just looking for work. Um, so on top of that, one of the things that was really interesting to me about both Megna and, uh, uh, no, 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 this, this, I have my quote, my questions in the wrong order. One of the interesting things to me, uh, Rebecca, was your talk about economic productivity as bodily independence versus disability dependence. Um, and I think that that also kind of goes with um, Sarah's, um, with all of your talks about how worth and value are really embedded in this language that we still use today. So, with that in mind, I think I think the, the, what I what I want to know is in what ways I, I think we see more of that these days with um, uh, with things like hashtag the grind never stops. And now there's all this panic about things like quiet quitting. Uh, how do we shift the paradigm to show that people's that life value and their quality of life is inherent and isn't measured by how much they quote unquote grind? I don't know, I don't know if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. and. 
kind of following up to some of the answers from the last um, set of responses, these ideas about sort of what is normal and desirable and important about life, like economic productivity, also factor into how um, people are socialized and even in like a clinical sense. I think in CF, there's been a big push in a lot of transition models, like towards complete independence, taking care of yourself entirely. And it's so inconsistent with what has historically been a you know, very progressive disease with tremendous time demands. And so I think we really need to start you know, in childhood and in thinking about how adults living with the condition presently are living. Are many people needing to be on disability? There's that, that also that issue I mentioned where there is like no middle ground and options for people who want to contribute and feel better and enjoy their lives more by contributing in a work sense, but then are limited in terms of the types of insurance they can get if they do work. And so I think we need that type of structural change to come first <laughs> or to come alongside the sort of shifts in how we think about development and what matters in socializing and helping children grow up and enter adulthood with these types of conditions. Um, I think that's, you know, extremely critical starting point and why I think it's important that we think about disability from this temporal perspective as fluctuating and requiring different supports. Yeah, yeah so um, anybody else? Yeah, I was just gonna maybe build on that a little bit as, you know, I think there's also just generally sort of taking, you know, taking an understanding of ability that is not embodied um, and sort of understanding ability um, to its varying extents as something that is always situated in a particular context, in a particular set of social arrangements. Um, and depending on those arrangements, right, like, be it structures, be it accessible technologies, be it accessible working arrangements, um, whatever those arrangements are, whatever those kind of like the arrangements around or the context around a person is, contributes so much more to the extent of ability that is that allows them to pr participate in the way that they want to in society. And I think kind of making the shift from seeing ability as something that is necessarily embodied, that is necessarily um, geneticized and determined by one's genes and kind of shifting more to understanding it as a set of arrangements, as a set of contexts that can be enabling or disabling in various to various extents is, is a shift that we need to see happen more across, um, you know, laws, policies, things like that. Anybody else? This is a great conversation. If I could just add a concrete example that I think builds nicely on Megan's comment, but also, but also Sarah's work, COVID was a time to see that difference, like you showed between like genetic versus social. In CF, it's a very different story where people with CF at baseline have worse experiences from all viral insults and also yes. have been socialized to um, socialized to be pretty good about avoiding germs. So we saw less exacerbations during COVID, in part for medicine, but also because people could get accommodations, you know, to be at home, to, to do their work, to get schooling, um, absent those exposures. So I think it was a really critical lesson that I hope moves forward in terms of a, an easy accommodation that we all did <laughs> and that could continue for people who need it and who will, yeah, have different abilities when that um, social change is made. Fantastic. Uh, any, any, um, okay. The, the, the next thing, I think the other important thing is that Nina and Megna, I, I really enjoyed both of your conversations about, uh, about reproductive care, reproductive justice and abortion. I think one of the things that stood out to me when watching both of your presentations was in terms of cases of wrongful death and wrongful life. Um, and also in these abortion restrictions, one of the things that interested me the most is that we're talking about people with disabilities without including them in the league in the in both these cases these are very legal things these are not necessarily medical discussions um it seems like there is not an inclusion of people with disabilities in actually the lawmaking and could you talk more about that and, the, and how 
the, the, the making of these laws, not including people with disabilities, leads to adverse effects. I guess I can talk a little bit about sort of the lawmaking process. Please do. Um, Sorry for I asked an interesting question. Um, selective abortion bans, and it really is, I mean, I mentioned a little bit that it was um, sort of started with model legislation um, that was drafted by an anti-abortion group and then just sort of carried over state to state um, and sort of changed a little bit at the margins. Um, but there was not um, in any of the states thus far that have introduced them or passed them um, really an effort to assess the um, needs or desires of the disability community. Um, and it really is stunning when you read transcripts of debates and you look at um, committee materials and things like that from the legislative process. There's just like a total absence of people with disabilities. Um, and there's just so much talk about, um, like you said, about the community and without inclusion of the community. And I think it gives a false sense um, of sort of where this is coming from and what it can accomplish um, when you don't include people who would actually um, have perspective on that. And I think it really um, shows in uh, how the laws actually function. Yeah, and I think, you know, specifically talking around like wrongful birth and wrongful life cases, I think the nature of I think the nature of the way that these cases play out, right, it is courts sort of interpreting technologies. It's courts interpreting how should these technologies be used towards what end. And in those processes, uh, processes, it's actually when, you know, when you read the court, the transcripts of judgments, it's quite jarring because people who are, or children who are disabled, whose parents are bringing these suits on their behalf, are sort of made to put their, their children almost on exhibition um, to sort of say, you know, to, to kind of use to kind of use and um, promote again this idea of embodied disability and sort of looking at disability as this spectacle. And I think the nature, of course, of these of this particular you know these particular torrents is again like trying to place individual blame for these types of for these for a disability as a type of unwanted outcome. Um, and so we're not. The way that, you know, plaintiffs, if you will, the way that their voices are included in these adjudication processes is perhaps even more marginalizing to um, disability justice co conversations and to people in these communities because of the way that they're made into spectacles, because of the way that they are kind of, you know, this process really emphasizes individual blame for disabilities in a particular way. Um, I mean, I, I, and all of that said, I think there is recently we are we are seeing kind of more voices in um, more voices of, you know, disabled communities being a part of lawmaking. I think um, the uh, I'm thinking on I think nothing without us, the the movement in the US, that's like that's a big stride that I think we're seeing now, but it needs to shift so much more. We need to have more of those conversations. And I think also fundamentally restructure the way that, right, these, the way that one can even claim damages for um, a child with disabilities, the way that that process situates disabilities on a systems level needs to change as well. Certainly, uh, anybody, I, I saw some people motioning it. Does anybody else want to make anything or going on to the next question? Sorry, uh, so, so one of the other things that was really interesting to me was this individual, Magda, Nina, and then Rebecca to another extent, all, but all of you talked about this kind of individualization of, um, of uh, uh, for disability and making it a very, very private matter. But then at the same time, it seems like one of the real paradoxes is the individuals have to individualize their care. They're asking for help. They're asking for accommodations. But then there's also this collectivizing. There's this, there's this rhetoric of collectivizing of this costs too much for the state. It costs too much. You see this a lot with talking about home care. It costs too much. 
Uh, what do you make of that paradoxical language of collect of individualizing care and collectivizing the talk of burden? I don't know if that makes sense. And anybody could go. Um, I mean, just briefly, I, th I think that actually that there's not so much of a paradox in that because I think that the idea of individualizing um, what you call disorder and sort of uh, attributing blame um, is actually part of the same process in the sense that you're saying that it's sort of it's it's these people are in some way, if not directly blameworthy and at least individually responsible for their own uh, purported uh, deficiency. And that they, as sort of an othered category, are therefore detrimental to the in-group category. And I think it's part of the same process. Um, and I also think that, as I'd mentioned, that's part of a process whereby then uh, policy and public resources are then uh, given elsewhere, in the sense that once you've attributed blame to a certain category of person, that's part of establishing that they don't deserve public resources. And I think that that, that is all kind of a connected system, um, in my view. It is. Anybody else want to talk about the collectivization or? <laughs> okay, I want to take some, I want to take some of the questions from some of the audience, if that is fine with any of you. Um, there was this one question from David Wasserman saying, I'm curious, Sarah and, and the other panelists, what you think about the prospect of fetal medication for Down syndrome that would accelerate new, new neural development prenatally? What would such medicate? How would, would such medication be problematic, even if they were effective in increasing cognitive development without significant burden or risk to the child or the mother? Um, I guess I can go first, but again, um, briefly, I yeah. think first of all, just I'm I'm curious about this hypothetical medication. Um, I think that the, the assumptions of a lack of burden, you know, the, there's certainly some criterion of, upon which that's based, and we don't necessarily know what they mean by lack of burden or lack of risk. Um, and also, I wonder if this medication is, is so is in some sense so great, why doesn't everybody just get it? Why is it only limited to, to certain sorts of people if it's uh, riskless and um, something that we purportedly all, all want? So it's, just, it's a hypothetical. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. My apologies. Um, shoot. I'm, I keep on pressing the mute button. I'm sorry. Uh, um, one of the things that stood out to me was that much of the standards about quality of life as we know it were written by people who are not themselves disabled. This goes to the legal discussion. What are the ways that they can be included in actually writing these standards now? Can they, or is it so? Are, is our language and the paradigm so embedded in how we understand disability that we need to start over? How do we work within systems that were so, where ableism is kind of in, in root and branch? And this is for anybody. I can say for um, in the context of genetic selective abortion bans, um, I think my feelings on them are fairly clear, but I don't think a discussion of quality of life has a role there, but where it does have a role is how we address prenatal testing um, outside of that context and sort of the, how we're able to educate people and communicate about disability. And I think that's really where we ought to be putting the focus. Um, a lot of that has to do with genetic counseling. I don't think it's limited to genetic counseling, um, especially because not everyone um, does or is able to access that. Um, but I think that's really where the push has to be. And I think there are a lot of questions on the best way to do that, but I, I think it's doable. I think Anybody also, else? yeah, adding to that, I think also shifting from seeing um, disabilities or supporting those with disabilities as a private burden, as a private mm -hmm. responsibility, shifting that 
to questioning why that is not a societal responsibility. Why is that not a public responsibility? And I think moving from constructing sort of private interests, um, you know, malpractice, like wrongful birth and life, I think are a great example of this because they are really malpractice claims that are situated in trying to get pri like, you know, um, private resources for families to support their children when indeed it's sort of a result of not having an adequate public um, support system for yes. those with disabilities, right? And so they're kind of making that transition. And I think, of course, key to that transition is significantly and meaningfully engaging um, community, like the disabled communities in making, in making that shift. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. No, that's really important. And I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I think that's really interesting how like the, 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 the demand for public for private resources is because of a lack of social safety nets. Uh, on top of that, I think one of the things that it really interested me, uh, and uh, Rebecca, this might be more for you, and this might be for everyone, is that, uh, but, but anybody can comment, is that you mentioned that, is that, you talk about prognostic imagination and how um, for some people it was like, wow, you could live to be 30 or 40. And then others was like, wow, I'm gonna die really young. So it's this, but I, I think it's also inte integrally important. We talk a lot about nothing about us without us. And some of you have mentioned it. In what ways can prognostic imagination and the kinship you mentioned lead to a type of advocacy that is more inclusive and allows for people with disabilities to have stakeholders and kind of push back on these and push back on these very ableist systems. And Rebecca, it's for you, but I, I see a lot of you nodding. So any of you, you can come come on in. Well, I think that this this is, you know, happening to an extent within CF. I think the conversations earlier about sort of the differences, different disabilities and universalizing disability are also really relevant here. Personally, I think in genetics, we're at a moment where there's a lot of groups focused, you know, very much on their disease specific needs where there's a lot of overlap and parallels. And then actually my next project, I'm trying to study like a number of these evolving pediatric conditions to draw attention to those parallels that are sort of social <laughs> and, and pull us away from just the specific medical needs of patients. So I, I do think that bringing people together within these disease categories or condition categories is already happening. And I think it's a really fruitful space that's not been sufficiently mined from a research perspective. I think so much of what we've done focuses in CF on kind of younger individuals and doesn't look at the people who have survived as sort of a key frontier for figuring out what makes the most sense, what is necessary and what would be best for later generations. But my hope in my next project, my hope in having gatherings like this through NHGRI, that we can see more commonalities across groups. Somebody asked in the chat whether we're sort of pitting congenital versus acquired disabilities and like where does aging fit? I hope my talk showed that like I see aging as on the continuum of disabilities like CF and CF is impacted by aging. And actually, if we have a society that more readily accommodates um, and sort of organically accommodates without requests, <laughs> people with these types of disabilities, it will be better for people who are struggling to raise their kids alongside a career. It will be better for people who are aging or whose parents are aging, right? There's tremendous needs that are just um, across society that are in some ways just most pronounced within these lifelong conditions. I see a lot of nodding along. Does anybody want to add anything? I mean, I was just going to emphasize, Rebecca, that point is so important. I think these, the idea that, you know, these public safety nets would really only benefit this, you know, the disabled community is, is such a fallacy because those types of accommodations, those types of supports would be beneficial society wide, right? These are, these having more inclusive structures, having more inclusive systems, it is, advantageous to everybody. It is advantageous to everybody to have structures that promote diverse existences. Um, and so I think, I mean, that's also another kind of like sh paradigm shift in thinking, right? Like thinking, moving from seeing 
supports as just exclusive to one population to seeing them as a society wide benefit. Um, yeah, Rebecca, I think your point about right, it would it would uh, benefit people who are trying to raise children alongside careers in general um, is such an important and I think like generally appealing kind of point to make around some of these things as well. And, um, you know, hopefully kind of change the thinking to just much broader public support. Anyone else? Uh, I can think we uh, go ahead, Sarah. I just want to say that I um I just wanted to say I really appreciate the the sort of temporality perspective, and I think that it does tie into and some of the things I was talking about um, with Down syndrome or even autism or other things, where which there's this imagination of uh, it being something that affects children, and that it's yes. sort of the children are thought of in relation to their parents rather than as adult individuals who are sort of speaking for themselves. That, that that is that is incredibly important. And I think that was one that was one common strain was that we we tend to and on top of that, I think that it also you mentioned that, and I think it goes to the point that I think that we see hate dealing with children as easier because we see children as angelic and young and innocent, but whereas you know it's a lot harder to care for, or like we tend to pass judgment more on disabled adults than we pass on disabled children. I think. Um, uh, I'm going to get off my soapbox because I want to get on get on to one last question. I, I think that the most important. I think that you know we all of you. I mean, both you, you Magna, and all of you. I mean, we can't not talk about Dobbs v. Jackson and how it kind of subverted a lot of our ideas uh, about reproductive justice and, and and wrongful life and wrongful death. What are the um, but it seems like, at least in my in my day job, I'm a political journalist, and it seems like the disability narrative on both sides uh, is being excluded. How? What are the most from from your research or from your from your gathering? How? Uh, what? What do we lose? What do we not gain when we? exclude disabled voices from talking about abortion and talking about uh, and talking about reproductive rights and reproductive health and reproductive justice. I don't know if that's too broad a question. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. But I will just start by saying people with disabilities need reproductive rights themselves. Yes. There's a great New York Times editorial from this perspective, a, a couple of months back, my, I think last name is Seismer, saying like, I my body wouldn't withstand a pregnancy. And it also is like being protected by, you know, it is also kind of the type of pregnancy that might be terminated. These things are, right, people live. And if we look at the adults with these disabilities, it really um, collapses a lot of these arguments because protecting or, you know, eliminating the right of abortion for these fetuses will, you know, kill people and, and yes. many people with disabilities who cannot sustain a pregnancy. Yeah, I think it presents a lot of the issues too about genetic counseling. And I know it's been yes. a very difficult time to be a genetic counselor and what can you talk about and not talk about. And it's hard to have um, really honest conversations um, about disabilities prenatally, and otherwise, um, and like Rebecca said, like for people living with disabilities, um, this is all really important. Um, and so it's not sort of, um, there's no one answer, um, but it really just um, makes it difficult to accommodate people with disabilities discussion about disabilities in a holistic sense. And it's not just limited to pregnancy, but sort of a holistic um, idea of an autonomous life. Yes. Magna, Sarah, do you want to add anything? I... <laughs> I'm, I, I, you know, I think Nina, Rebecca, I think you, you both really, you both really covered it. And Nina, I think your, your talk on, on this topic was, was really powerful. Um, as as Rebecca said, I mean, I think the 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 right to an abortion, the ability to have an abortion for whatever a person's reasons might be, 
is just important. I think the, like seeing abortion as a healthcare right, as a um, as a healthcare intervention, as um, whatever that might whatever that might be, but but kind of contextualizing it in it is not a moral discussion. It's not a social discussion, right? It, it's about healthcare and it's about access to healthcare um, for whatever a person's reasons may be. Um, and I think kind of shifting that the thinking as as Nina your talk was doing into the framework of reproductive justice um, and including voices from the disabled community in that way and. Um, I think that is that is that is key kind of just situating it as a healthcare discussion. Certainly well, this is our time I really wish we could continue this all. Your presentations were incredible. I really want to thank you guys for putting up with a with a poor sap like me who doesn't know as much. Hopefully, I elevated you guys as you got you guys and made you guys look incredible. Um, thank you to the NIH. Thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank you to all the people who promoted this. And, uh, and and I really just want to thank you. And hopefully, we can keep in contact. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, thanks so much, panelists. Uh, we will be having a break. Uh, from right now until 3.30 3, uh, 3 for our keynote lecture from Professor Dennis Tyler. So please stay with us. Thank you so much.